Um, so hopefully you guys know the story of St. Patrick. If you don't, I'm about to tell it to you. So uh, the story of St. Patrick, and I, I'm telling this for a reason, is when he was a teenager, he um, was playing on the shores, and actually Irish pirates, uh, Celtic pirates come, this is ancient church. They come and they capture all the kids and they take them back to Ireland as slaves. And Patrick said that when he was growing up, he really did not care for religion. And even though his grandfather was a priest and his father was a deacon, he said he never cared for religion. And remember, in the history of the church, priests used to be able to get married. Um, except he gets hauled away to Ireland as a slave. And as a slave, it's actually a brutal life, um, he begins to pray. And he says he prays hundreds of prayers per day. And um, he, because he was a slave, he actually would have to sleep outside. And he said, um, you know, in that time period, just praying night and day, he said what he discovered was God. And he discovered God outside. So I think it's kind of interesting. He would say he always felt uh, more comfortable praying outside than inside a church. But of course, um, he prays and prays and prays. And one day he hears this voice. And the voice tells him that his ship is ready. And that it's time to escape slavery. Now, if he gets caught, he'll be executed. But... He follows the voice, and the voice actually does lead him to the ship where eventually he reunites with his family, um, and he becomes a priest, except when he becomes a priest, the voice returns, and the voice is begging him to return to Ireland, to evangelize Ireland, and he really did not want to go. That was a place of, you know, brutality, and... Then he gets these visions, and then he hears, and I like this part, the children's children of the Irish begging him, thanking him to return to Ireland, which is what we do on St. Patrick's Day. But um, he goes back to Ireland, and as you know the story, great success. And not only that, but for the people who he actually hated, he falls in love with them. Because, you know, the Irish are easily lovable. Um, but what I like about the story is that what the prayer allowed him to do is hear the voice that was always calling him. Or, and I can repeat this same story a thousand ways, but just one more. And it's about Sojourner Truth. If you don't know, she's also one of my great heroes. Sojourner Truth, which I've spoken about her before, she was a slave in uh, the American South before the Civil War. And she was this uneducated black woman who prayed and prayed and prayed. And just like St. Uh, Patrick, one day hears the voice of God. And the voice of God is telling her to escape. And as long as she did what the voice said, move when the voice says, stop when the voice says, she walked to freedom. And so she used to joke where she'd say, um, I love this, where she said, I didn't run from slavery, I walked. <laughs> and what she meant by that is that she said, and I like this phrase, the spirit was calling me. And as long as she obeyed when the spirit said to move and not move, she simply walked to freedom. Um, and then the voice comes back. And the voice, her name was Isabella. The voice wants her to take a new name because now she has a purpose in her life, and that is to end slavery. And she had these visions, not only of one day slavery ending, but this is unbelievable, one day all people would be treated equal, that even in the United States, blacks would be treated equal to whites, that women would be treated equal to men. And what I like about that is that, about these two stories, that really with this great prayer life, it not only leads you from slavery into freedom, but actually into this whole new morality. This whole new morality. And so what really prayer does, prayer is not, and this really ticks me off, I, is not asking God to give you something. If you think that's what prayer is, sorry, you're not really a Catholic. Yes, we do pray and ask God for things, but the main purpose of prayer 
is not to tell God what you want. What a lifetime of prayer does is give us a capacity to hear God, to hear the voice that, as Sojourner Truth would say, is always calling out to us. And it moves us from this slavery to this great feast where all people will be gathered together. And that feast, in case you didn't know, is the Lamb of God, the feast of the Lamb of God. In the second reading, you have this image from about heaven that I love, that all people who hear the voice, their hearts will be drawn to the feast of the Lamb of God. It's actually the Lamb that is calling out to us, moving us from this slavery into this great feast in heaven. So when John sees heaven, and I'm, I love his, this, when John sees heaven, he's standing and he's turned the wrong direction, and he hears that 144,000 are in heaven. And he turns to look at heaven, and when he sees it, he sees a countless number of people, more than that, of every race, language, and way of life, all united around the Lamb of God. So it has this image of um, heaven, is that in the center of heaven is an altar, and on the altar is really God, the Lamb of God. And all around is all these people of every race, language, and way of life. They heard the call of the Lamb. And just to get freak you out, and I, um, not only people have a race, language, and life, but even the angels are surrounded the altar. Not only angels, but the seraphim. We don't even know what seraphim are. They're called to the Lamb of God. Even the tetramorphs. And then you can say, what are the tetramorphs? We really don't know. But it's more than just human beings. The Lamb calls out to everyone. And if you notice in the description, it des describes us human beings as wearing these white robes. That's what this is. Um, what the white robes symbolize is you get one at your baptism. And it's what the high priest would wear at the Feast of the Lamb of God. But it's a prayer shawl. Remember, if you're Jewish, when you'd pray, you'd wrap yourself in this prayer shawl. So when we baptize a child, we wrap them in this prayer shawl. That like Patrick, like Sojourner Truth, their life will be wrapped in prayer. And what they'll eventually be able to is be drawn to the great feast of life, the Lamb of God. And when we baptize, we baptize with a shell, just FYI, because a shell in the very ancient church, sorry, ancient society, if you were taking a journey somewhere, you'd have a shell, it'd become your plate and your spoon. And so the shell symbolizes you're making this long journey not really from slavery to Ireland or the north, really from slavery to the great feast of life. Um, that all people are called to it. That's what our prayer life is supposed to be. But not, not just our prayer life. And I love this image that John, not only does he, well, John hears that the powerful lion of Judah is in heaven. And once again, he turns around, and what he sees is not a lion, but a slain but living lamb. The gentlest creature you can think of, a baby lamb. Um, God is pictured as the, la the Lamb of God is ultimate gentleness. The Lamb of God symbolizes self-sacrificing love. So the idea is that, yeah, those people whose life is wrapped in prayer, whose hearts are inclined towards love, they'll be drawn to this great feast. Um, and so the lamb is the one that calls out. So in today's gospel, um, you have to kind of understand it. In today's gospel, the Pharisees are upset with Jesus, and they say, tell us plainly. In Greek it says, Keep, stop holding our souls. Tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? And Jesus' answer is basically, I have been telling you, you just can't hear it. Because the Pharisees, their idea of prayer is not listening to the voice. Their idea of prayer is telling God what you want. Um, the Pharisees, they really haven't wrapped their life in prayer. The Pharisees have wrapped their lives in rules and regulations. And so, this is my belief. Don't argue with me. It's what I believe. No, seriously. I... You can dedicate yourself to the Catholic Catechism, and it's good. 
but you rely too heavily on catechisms and rules, then you don't become like Sojourner Truth or Patrick, that the thing that really leads you is not rules and regulations. It's really the voice of the Lamb. And so Christ basically says to the Pharisees, you can't hear me. The only thing they want to hear is rules and regulations and who's going to be punished. Then you won't hear the Lamb. So he says, my sheep hear my voice. Um, the idea in the ancient world, I have no idea, that supposedly because shepherds spent so t- much time with their sheep, their sheep actually would know the voice of the shepherd. And so when the shepherd calls, automatically they would respond. And when Christ says that, it means as automatically as a sheep responds to the shepherd, our hearts respond to the voice of God. But the truth is, is that our hearts take a lot of work. They need to be wrapped in love, in prayer, and then like Patrick and Sojourner Truth, it leans to the very source of that voice, which is the Lamb of God. And so, in baptism, all of us have ritually done it. Every time we go to Mass and celebrate, you know, the Eucharist is called the Lamb of God. When we celebrate the Lamb of God, it's really that our hearts are inclined towards the ultimate source of love. Uh, that's where we're leaning into. That's where our, our life is taking a journey to. So this weekend, um, two, in two weeks, we're going to celebrate First Communion. I'm going to have all the First Communicants come forward, and they're going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer uh, before Communion. But just to explain this to you, the reason why the Lord's Prayer is there When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're not praying for daily bread. That's just an awful, horrible, ugly translation. Hate it. Um, Literally, in the Greek, what you're praying for is the bread of life or the bread from heaven. Um, You're really praying for the Eucharist. And what you're praying, that a lifetime of your heart desiring the bread of life, the Lamb of God, your life will be led on this journey. Really, away from slavery, where you can celebrate the great gathering. Just the term, the Lamb of God, what it should evoke in your minds is this deep, intimate, mystical communion that our hearts are moving towards. That's the Lamb of God. Now, for our children who are going to make their first communion, I just think it's the very beginning of this journey. So, for us who gather together, to celebrate the Feast of the Lamb of God, hopefully over a lifetime, like millions of other mystics, what our hearts are being tuned to is the voice of love. And so together, let us stand and renew our baptismal vows.